Thank you guys for come for this talk. What I want to present about today is what we've been building for the past six months, a financially accountable watching network. And this is in collaboration with Chris, who's in the audience, Sergi, and Salvatore. And I want, what I really want to highlight is that normally when people think of PISA, they think of off-chain protocols and scalability. So I've actually taken this moment where this talk is not going to have anything to do with off-chain protocols whatsoever. I want to highlight how PISA is generally useful for most top developers. Cool. Now, what I'm going to begin with is actually a watching network is a misnomer. There's actually two different roles in this third-party broadcasting network. We have relayers, which are meta transactions. You know, you give a transaction to this third party, and they guarantee that it gets relayed to the network. Or you have watchers, you know, these watchtowers. And a watchtower, you can be hired simply to watch for events on the blockchain. If there's an event, it will then respond in your behalf. So that's why it's actually a third-party broadcasting network, which sounds really boring, you know, LOL. But that's actually what it is. So why do we have, you know, relayers and responders? Relayers try to solve the problem when the user doesn't have access to the native token. So this could be onboarding new users, accessing coins in a contract like a multi-sig, or mixing and tubbling as well. Where watchtowers and responders they try to alleviate the user liveness requirement. That's to say you do an auction, you know, you submit your bid, three days later you have to reveal your bid, and you don't want to come online in three days' time. So the watchtower can just do that in your behalf. Of course, the main motivation's always been off-chain protocols like Plasma and State Channels, and you can also do data availability providers as well. So what is the perception of a third-party broadcasting network. You know, how do people typically think about it in their protocols? Well, first you have a user, and this is the anime edition, by the way, of the talk. So the user typically has a job, and what they're going to do is hire multiple watchtowers at exactly the same time. So they're going to send the job out, you know, bam, bam, bam. And then multiple watchtowers now have the job. But the user has to pay for multiple watchtowers. So this sounds a bit crazy expensive, doesn't it? So typically what people do instead is that there's this on-chain bounty. So the first watchtower, the, you know, the relay the transaction, and get it in the blockchain, will get the claim this bounty. So can you see the obvious problem with this? If you've hired 20 watchtowers and they're all competing for the same bounty, you're going to get spam, 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 spam. You know, only one watchtower is going to get rewarded, and the rest are going to have to pay a penalty, you know, the gas price of a transaction, for failing to get it in. And that's not very good. You know, as an illustrated example, bam, you know, the reward is given to this watchtower. Now, if they're competing for this 5K, you know, $5,000 as a bounty, that's fine. Over the long period, you make some losses, you win. But if they're competing for $5, that just sucks, you know, who wants to compete for $5 and lose money in the long run? So that's not a great way to build these third-party watching networks. An alternative approach with people tend to recommend is, why don't we, you know, do segments? So Watchtower 1 can respond by time T1, Watchtower 2 can respond by T2, up to TN. Now the issue here is that it's really awkward to enforce. Either your smart contract considers this upfront, or you somehow try to enforce this in an off-chain manner, which doesn't really work either. So I've never really considered this as a real valid solution to the problem. And then the worst case scenario, you guys hired 20 watchers, and nobody responded, and your transaction was never relayed. Maybe you lost the auction, you lost money in your state channel. Well, there's no evidence, there's no recourse, nothing. So that really sucks just from a user perspective. You can't blame anyone, because they didn't do their job. So why do we always think this is the best way to build this third-party broadcasting network? You know, it's actually really frustrating because it's clearly awkward and it doesn't work that well. You know, I've got my little anime gif there. So from the end user perspective, why are we trying to design these third-party relay networks in this fashion? So what are the goals that we're trying to achieve? Typically, we're trying to minimize trust. We don't want to blindly trust a single party to respond on our behalf. And also for the availability of broadcasters. If I hire 22 watchers, hopefully one's at least online to complete the job for me. 
But what most people seem to forget about is accountability. You know, if the watchtower doesn't do the job for me, can I prove that and can I hold them accountable? So this is basically what we're building at PISA, a financially accountable third-party broadcasting network. So now I'm going to start my talk. Cool. So what is PISA? Basically, we have this broadcaster. He has skin in the game and coins locked up on the blockchain. And there's a PISA contract, which is effectively the service level agreement between the tower and the customer. Now, when the customer hires PISA, you send the job to PISA, and in return, the customer would get a signed receipt. So now they have you know, cryptographic evidence that they've actually hired PISA or a watchtower. So what type of job can PISA accept? Both. It can be a relayer, you know, these meta transactions, and it can be a responder. It can watch for events and respond on your behalf. And of course, the way it would look like is, you know, Alice and Bob do something, Alice hires PISA, Alice goes offline. If there's an event on the blockchain, then PISA will simply respond on Alice's behalf. Then Alice can come back online later, and then she can, you know, verify that PISA and the Watchtower actually did its job. Now the question is, what if PISA didn't respond? What if PISA didn't do the job and didn't protect the customer, you know, when it, when it promised it would? Can we do anything about that? And that's exactly what PISA is trying to solve. PISA is a trust minimized, you know, third party broadcaster because it has financial liability. The user has a signed receipt that they hired this watcher. And they have on chain evidence that PISA didn't do its job. You simply submit both pieces of evidence to the PISA contract. Whoops. Then the PISA contract will look at the evidence, evaluate it, and say, yep. PISA didn't do its job. So now it forces his refund period. And there's two outcomes. Either Alice is refunded a pre-agreed amount that was you know, specified in the signed receipt, or PISA is eventually sloshed. So PISA issues the refund, really straightforward. You send the money, you know, that challenge is canceled, and everyone's happy. So I've got one question here. Who's ever sent a transaction to the network that lingered for six hours? There we go, look at these, you're all DAP developers, definitely. Now what would be nice is if it lingers for six hours, you're gonna get a $20 refund from PISA. You know, so you're gonna have a little smile on your face because you made money for that, for the bad UX user experience. Anyway, if PISA doesn't give you that $20 refund, well, you know, blocks keep ticking, PISA gets slashed, and PISA will lose his money and be very upset. And that's the basic principle about, you know, behind this. Now what is this on-chain evidence actually look like? Well, first, let's look at the relay case, these meta transactions. Every time you hire PISA to relay a transaction on your behalf, PISA will relay that via the PISA contract. And it simply keeps a record of every attempt. Okay? Now, yeah. So it keeps a record of that attempt. So later on, if you come online, you know, PISA promised you this transaction will be relayed before time t. You come online after time t, you look at the PISA contract, and there's no record of the attempt. If there's no record of the attempt, PISA didn't do its job, you just send over the signed receipt, and PISA gets punished. So that's cool. That actually works out of the box today. On the other hand, what about the responder? Well, in the case of the responder, basically, we have to look for events in the other contract. So let's consider the auction. We have to watch out for you know, the auction to be triggered. Sorry. Yeah, we have to watch out for the auction to be triggered. Once it's been triggered, then there's evidence the auction was triggered and that we didn't respond. Now the issue is that this can work today, but it requires its external contract to use our data registry. And that's not great. It's a bit invasive. We want to make sure we have seamless integrations to PISA. So for seamless integrations, we have to push for this hard fork for block dot block hash. If we have this you know, hard fork, then we can use the transaction receipts in a block as evidence that PISA didn't do its job. If you want to learn more information about that, just check out this wonderful blog post that Chris wrote. Oh, and I also found this emoji. I was trying to find a fork emoji. So if you want to 
get this in the iOS, you know, sign up to the change.org. So what's the current state of the PISA project? You know, this is something we've been working on for two years in terms of designing the protocol, and now we've been trying to implement it for the past six months. What's nice is that we envision it to be like an Infura-like API. As a DAP developer, you're simply going to have a very simple API like this. You tell PISA, when do you need that transaction delivered? What was the call data? And what is the contract address? You simply call the API, and in return, you'll get a signed receipt. And that's awesome. And right now, our current guinea pigs are Connex and L4. So now we're actually trying to do an integration to see how well this works. And once it works, everyone here can try it out. And of course, if you want to find more information about it, our client information is on N, you know, MP, MP, M, J, S, and everything's open source. So you can just look at this repo, and you can see exactly how PISA works today, you know, and try it locally amongst yourselves. Now, why is PISA a boring, tedious, and hard project? Actually, PISA is a high availability, reliability, and fault-tolerant project. What do I mean by that? So if you're a DUP developer, and you've got to guarantee transactions for your users get in the blockchain, what you've got to worry about is bumping the fee during congestion. You've got to worry about managing the balance of multiple hot wallets to pay for gas, managing dependent and chain transactions, handling block reorgs and hard forks, detecting these emitted events, taking data from it, and using that as part of the response. And one really good example of this was DeFi Saver. You know, if you combine, if you pick two or more of the above, it becomes non-trivial. So DeFi chain, uh, Saver had a chain transaction, but in the chain, the first transaction had a low fee. It had a low fee, and it didn't get in, which meant the other transactions also didn't get in. So this is actually a non-trivial problem to build. And actually, most projects have to do this which sort of sucks. It's taken us four or five months to get an alpha version that we're sort of comfortable with. If we expect that, you know, every team to replicate this, you've already lost four or five months of engineering time. So that's exactly why I think PISA is useful for most top developers. Now, what about the future of PISA? What I really want to build is a watching pool. OK? So typically, when people think about these watching networks, every all the watchers are in competition where actually you can have a pool. We have this non-trusted coordinator. You know, I send the job to the PISA server. The PISA server will send the job to each watcher. If we get care of N watchers are green, we get a fully signed receipt. Then the signed receipt goes out to the customer. So actually, all the watchers are watching each other's backs. So at least, you know, we, you know our service gets DOSed. Hopefully, one remains online. That's also the motivation for N-level programming. They avoid critical bugs. Now, what about the security collateral lockup? A lot of people ask about this. You know, one of the main criticisms of PISA is that we may have to lock up 50K dollars to really show that we have skin in the game. What's nice is that we can outsource that. Other people can donate the money on our behalf, and they're sort of betting on our reputation that we won't get slashed. And by betting on our reputation, you get a share of that revenue. And we can also just lock it up in Maker and Compound, and then use that money to earn interest as well. So it's actually quite nice. You know, the money doesn't go to waste. You know, it's a real store of value. Now I just want to finish with my takeaway message of all of this, you know, talk. What makes cryptocurrency so great? You know, why are we all excited about it? From my perspective, what makes cryptocurrency so great is that everything is publicly verifiable. And we have a set of, you know, we have a decentralized set of validators. Anyone in the world can validate blocks in real time. If you're validating a block, you can you know, hold the miners accountable. You validate it, and you accept it, or, or you reject it. If the miners cheat, you just reject the block. And what you're actually doing is holding the block producers financially accountable if they produce bad blocks. And that's really cool. So I guess my motivation for the past few years, and what we're trying to now build at PISA, is let's bring financial accountability to every single online service, starting with you know, third-party broadcast networks. We're building this you know, financially accountable third party. And this is what everyone in this room should be aiming towards as well. 
we should be building services so that the, you know, the terms of the you know, service level agreement are easily enforceable and verifiable. We should not blindly trust third parties. We should verify everything they do. And if the third parties deviate from the protocol or if they cheat, we should have an ability to issue punishments you know, to make sure we hold them financially accountable. And that's actually what makes cryptocurrency so great. You know, that's Satoshi's real vision of why he built this entire system. So that's basically the end of this talk. You know, our goal is to build this financially accountable third party broadcasting network. Hopefully people here realized I did not talk about off-chain protocols whatsoever. It's generally useful for most smart contracts. And that's hopefully we're going to be, I mean, there's an alpha version running already, and hopefully the API will be publicly available very soon.